Hello, and welcome to this edition of the Historical Society of Harford County's Speaker Series. We're really pleased today to welcome Kara Mae Harris, the blogger at Old Line, Old, Old Line Plate. Um, Kara has a collection of over 300 cookbooks with recipes from Maryland from the earliest possible days of cookbooks. Um, she's here today to share with us um, festive Maryland recipes um, so that we can learn more about how recipes, the kinds of foods that people in Maryland have eaten over the centuries. With that, I'll turn it over to Kara. Thank you so much for having me. I'll go ahead and um, share screen. Yes, please. A small headline in the Democratic Advocate of Westminster, Maryland on December 7th, 1872. Um, this was the day after that year's Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving used to be announced each year. It would be on different dates. Um, so the anonymous author was very excited the day after Thanksgiving and said, prepare for the holidays. Thanksgiving past, Christmas is next in order. The sauerkraut and the apple butter, what a pity we can't find a better name for this popular edible, are already laid up in store. Fat turkeys and cranberry sauce with crisp and well-bleached celery are now to be looked after. And links of luscious sausage seasoned with pepper and sage and other condiments. And the dish of hot smoking hominy, white as the driven snow, that good old Maryland morsel, nowhere else made to such perfection as here. This article went on to mention trinkets and trifles and Christmas trees and stockings, but the point had already been made. Holidays equal food, and this author was hankering for it. The press in Maryland has always been standing at the ready to rhapsodize about something good to eat. Better still, if the food has a Marylandness about it. These reminiscences of food give us insight into the culture of our state, but they rarely paint the whole picture. The magic for them is in the eating. Buried within the women's pages of these same newspapers, you can sometimes find recipes. They're straightforward and sparse. For the people who clipped and cooked these recipes, a few ingredients and very brief instructions were enough to spark their imaginations and place them within their position in the memory soon to be made. Maryland food used to be famous across the Western world. Caterers would allegedly ship their terrapin soup to London. Deviled crabs were popular all over the country. Canvas bat duck was famous far and wide. Maryland fried chicken used to be a standard for luxury hotels and railroads. It was served aboard the Titanic. When we think of sophisticated cooking today, we often think of chefs working out of restaurants. That mostly wasn't the case in the 19th and early 20th century. Professional chefs were referred to as caterers, and they often worked out of Baltimore's famous hotels like the Emerson, Southern, and Belvedere. Caterers also served social clubs in private homes and famous socialite events like the Bachelor's Cotillion. The catering industry enabled some Black families in Baltimore particularly to accumulate wealth and prestige in a segregated era. Um, but there's a lot of complexity in that food culture. In 1917, an author named Julian Street wrote about his travels around the country. He wrote a lot about his stay in Baltimore. He came in through Penn Station, he visited Lexington Market, and he stayed at the Belvedere Hotel. He shopped on Antique Row. As he approached the city, he wrote this. My first real view of Baltimore was my first glimpse over the threshold of the South into the land of aristocracy and hospitality, of mules and mammies, of plantations, porticos, and proud flirtatious bells, of colonels, cotton, chivalry, and colored cooking. This was the image that was sold to tourists who visited Maryland. The industry um, was mostly in Baltimore, but there were other hotels along railroad lines and around the state in places like Cumberland and Haver de Grace. Um, the original cooking style was attributed to a lot of Maryland's old manors, like Winston, located along the Gunpowder River. A 1907 book called Colonial Recipes from Maryland Manners has three recipes from Winston, one for Charlotte Roos, um, black fruit cake, which would be a holiday recipe, and Irish potato pudding, which is what later became white potato pie. The book says that potato pudding is Dear to the heart of every Marylander to the manor born. 
And it speculates that a famous colonial belle named Betty Martin may have enjoyed that same recipe as one of her um, descendants contributed the recipe to the book. Betty Martin was the lady of the manor and she was said to have lived to be 120 years old. Sadly, we don't know exactly where Winston was located, but I've done some research that possibly places it near the Joppa branch of the Harford County Library. Any savvy recipe and cookbook authors capitalized on Maryland fame. Cookbooks and recipes had been around for centuries in different forms, but in the 1800s, there was this big cookbook boom. Community cookbooks became a standard way to raise money for churches, causes, social clubs, or just for fun. These are some of the books that I collect and document. They all have their own personalities and people would add their own recipes in the margins or write changes into the recipes themselves. Every church cookbook's a document full of names, people who have backstories and recipes that reflect the changing times. I take these recipes and I put them into a database, um, currently have over 50,000 recipes in it. So I have a lot of possibilities to draw from. So why did I choose holidays? Um, I wanted to do a holiday book because I'm very fascinated with the ways that holiday nostalgia intersects the whole Maryland mystique. There was a commercial industry um, built on those professional chefs, uh, many of whom they didn't leave behind recipes really because they didn't work from recipes. Um, but there's an interplay between the hospitality industry and home cooking, just as there is now. Um, many Marylanders who couldn't afford or weren't allowed to set foot in one of these hotels still had a lot of pride in their food and the recipes that they shared. Of course, further complicating that picture, we have the influence of groups of people who have come and left Maryland. Some traditions were adopted right into the fold, like sauerkraut served with turkey, which came by a German immigrants, um, or oyster stew, which stemmed from Irish Catholic traditions of foregoing meat on Christmas. Others played out a little bit more subtly, like the Pennsylvania Dutch influence. They brought Fosnacht donuts to Western Maryland under the name of Kinklings. We have Kinklings and Scrapple as vestiges of that influence. Um, other aspects were maybe lost to time, such as this one account of life in Allegheny County, um, which described Christmas. Um, and he said, we did not hear of that mystical personage now known as Santa Claus. Bell Snickel, sometimes known as the Christmas woman, came instead. Um, children not only saw the mysterious person, but felt him, or rather his stripes upon their backs with his switch. He would come with a sack of nuts and fruits and a long hazel switch. One hand would scatter the goodies upon the floor and then the scramble would begin by the delighted children. The other hand would ply upon the backs of the excited youngsters. Um, Western Maryland often gets left out of the picture of Maryland food, but aside from once being famous for maple syrup, there were traditions like the celebration of St. David's Day by the Welsh miners and Cornish saffron bread. It was said that the Frostburg post office smelled like saffron in December because people's relatives from Cornwall would mail them packets of saffron to their families. And of course, as evidenced by that whole idea of the plantation cooking that made Maryland famous, we have the influ influence of African cooking and traditions, both co-opted in a popular cuisine and restaurants and often carried out privately by families who maybe didn't write down recipes. I consulted a lot of oral histories and also this book, 300 Years of Black Cooking in St. Mary's County, which demonstrate the different ways that African spirituality and folklore remained with families throughout the changing conditions of life in Maryland. Um, Esther Smith from St. Mary's County recalled their tradition of the men going visiting the first thing, New Year's Day because being the first one to cross someone's doorway on New Year's Day was good luck. Philip Scribner recalled that from Christmas to New Year, no one did any work. They spent the whole day socializing. They made homemade cakes and root beer. In those days, you didn't have the money, but you had the love. Of course, not all groups have historically had access to produce cookbooks or even choose to write down recipes. Um, my database is always going to have those kind of holes and biases in them based on uneven samples of what people were cooking and eating in Maryland. Um, I am lucky enough to have a few cookbooks that are exceptions to the rule, and I referenced a lot of these in 
my book, Festive Maryland Recipes. Um, I mentioned this book, 300 Years of Black Cooking in St. Mary's County. It was put out in the 1970s by AmeriCorps volunteers working with local anti-poverty group called Citizens for Progress. It has recipes for crab cakes, white potato pie, sweet potato pie, shad roe, poke salad, and several recipes for stuffed ham. Stuffed ham originated with the people who were enslaved by Jesuit priests on plantations in St. Mary's County. Some people say it was originally made with other parts of the pig when hams would not be available to the enslaved people. So they were stuffed with a mixture of greens and spices, including mustard seed and hot pepper. And then the hams are boiled until everything is well cooked. It's a very um, unique and beloved tradition in St. Mary's County. You can get it in some local delis, but if you're a part of a St. Mary's County family, you might have that one person in your family who's the keeper of the flame. I can, I can also tell you that that's equally true in Charles County, which is adjacent to St. Mary's County. Yeah, I even have, um, I have at least one stuffed ham recipe that's uh, as far, far north as Calvert County. So it's mm -hmm. definitely, yeah, it's definitely a regional, a regional thing, um, you know, as it's spread around, but somehow, somehow not much further than that. I think it takes so much work to put into the stuffed hams that they really, you know, stay kind of close within families. It, it is a tremendous amount of work. I have a friend who does them one, like once a year, he'll make a big yeah. stuffed ham based on his family's recipe. Um, another another cookbook I was excited to get to reference um, for festive Maryland recipes was this relatively old Maryland Jewish cookbook. This was put out in 1905 and it benefited a Hebrew day nursery. At the time this book was made, Jewish charities were working with newly immigrated Jewish people from Eastern Europe, helping them maintain faith and traditions while getting them acclimated to life in Baltimore. Um, what's interesting about this book is that it has recipes for crab and oyster in it and other non-kosher preparations like Maryland fried chicken. I was delighted when I came across this cookbook called Recipes from Little Bohemia. It's from 1985. Um, it was put out by St. Wenceslas Bohemian Catholic Church, which is near Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. In 1910, the Czech population of that neighborhood called Little Bohemia numbered somewhere around 10,000. Um, the cookbook came out many decades later when the population of the area was shifting, but it documents many of the recipes that people would have used to celebrate Christmas there, including recipes for carp soup and a barley casserole called Cuba, which is in um, the Festive Maryland Recipes book. In 1907, the Baltimore Sun wrote about how these sturdy foreign-born folks celebrate Yuletide. And they said, among Baltimore's adopted citizens, none is more strict in the observance of the, fe uh, the feast than the Bohemian, who follows the customs of the old country to the letter. Um, festivities included Christmas trees, colorful candles, and rituals for good luck, and early morning mass. Um, carp was referred to as the Bohemian turkey, and the newspaper said, Bohemians would as soon do without their Cuba and carp as Americans without their turkey, mince pie, and plum pudding. When I first made recipes from the um, 1980 favorite recipes from the Women's Welsh Club of Baltimore, I wasn't aware that the Welsh presence in Maryland dated back to the 1830s when miners came to Western Maryland and Harford County, um, where to this day there's a town called Cardiff. Miners were recruited because they had actually worked with the same equipment. Um, and so they were recruited to do the slate mining in Maryland. In 1981, the owner of my personal copy of uh, the favorite recipes from the Women's Welsh Club tried a few of the recipes and wrote notes behind them, uh, beside them. In the margins next to the recipe for um, speckled bread, they wrote 1981, good, St. David's Day. And beside the recipe for Welsh ginger cream cake, they wrote St. David's Day, 1981, odd but good. The Feast of St. David, who's the patron saint of Wales, is observed on March 1st, which is the anniversary of his death in 589 AD. The holiday is generally a celebration of all things Welsh, from food to clothing to flora. In Baltimore, Welsh workers moved into a section of the Canton neighborhood that was briefly known as the Welsh Colony. In 1928, the Baltimore Sun 
wrote about the area, which by then was already fading with only remnants of its past, including a church on Toon Street and this dilapidated row of houses. When I finally found a cookbook of recipes from Baltimore's Little Italy, I was very excited. Um, first of all, it's so much delicious sounding food, but I also noticed how many Easter recipes there were, and I thought about what an important time Easter is to so many cultures. In an oral history from Little Italy, Ida Cipollini Esposito said that on Easter, it seemed like you just stopped. Everything stopped in the house. By Holy Thursday, your house would be immaculate, Everything had to be clean, and you'd go out visiting all the churches. She said that her family would spend days touring local churches, including those of other Catholic immigrant groups like the nearby Polish churches and probably Little Bohemia. This cookbook, um, Ambrosia and Nectar, I've actually talked to a lot of people who have copies of this book or say there's a copy in their mother's kitchen. Um, it's a 1962 Greek cookbook, and it's a Baltimore area classic. My own copy was donated to me from a cookbook collection of the late Dr. Patricia Smith. Um, as you can see in this picture, the book is well used. Its cover's fallen off, opening it's like opening a present. Um, it also contains many recipes associated with Easter, which would be Greek Orthodox Easter. Sometimes that falls on the same date, um, but many years it's a different weekend entirely from the other um, denominations. The recipe that we put in Festive Maryland Recipes uses an interesting ingredient, baking ammonia. Um, when you use it, it actually smells like ammonia, but the smell goes away as you bake the cookies and the cookies come out with kind of a unique crispness. Other recipes in the book for Easter include lamb lung soup and of course the bread baked with red Easter eggs. Another of my favorite cookbooks to reference is this 1986 Ladies of the Bethel cookbook put out by the Women's Fellowship of the Bethel Korean Church, which was located then in Baltimore and now it's in Ellicott City. Susan Park, who is the chairperson of the cookbook committee, wrote that the compilers of the book intended to introduce as many Korean recipes as possible to those accustomed to Western food. As you can see here, the book also repeats the recipes in Korean in the latter half of the book. It includes recipes for kimchi and Korean fried chicken, pickled shrimp, octopus with hot sauce, and also banana bread, crab imperial, New York cheesecake, corned beef, lasagna, and more. Of course, many of the traditional books that I reference are much older than these, um, from handwritten Community cookbooks like Maryland Cooking, which was put out by the Maryland Home Economics Association or a cook's tour of the Eastern Shore, all the way back to the first cookbook published by a Marylander, which is Domestic Cookery by Elizabeth Ellicott Lee. It's from 1859. The name may ring a bell as she was part of the Quaker family that owned the mills around Ellicott City. Her recipes, including her recipe for New Year's cakes, which are what we would now call cookies, made it into other cookbooks like Mrs. Benjamin Chu Howard's 1870 book, 50 Years in a Maryland Kitchen. Her recipe also appeared in some Maryland cookbook manuscripts. The wording and ingredients are very similar, um, sometimes exactly the same. In this way, putting these recipes into my database can demonstrate the influence of certain cookbooks on other cookbooks, or even the social connections that recipes would spread through. In the 1800s, women compiled cookbook manuscripts. It was a very popular thing to do. They would compile books of recipes from people they knew or even from women's magazines and newspapers. Newspapers were actually a big source of recipes and sometimes recipes would appear in newspapers all over the country, which is interesting because we kind of think of things as more regional, but they really did have a way to travel wider than you might think. Um, one of the oldest manuscript cookbooks in Maryland is kept at the Harford County Historical Society in the Eloise Wilson collection. The book is dated to 1810, probably due to a note written beneath a recipe for apple pudding. Bridgetown, March 7th, 1810, for Mrs. Fanny Giles. I knew this book was old when I looked through it because it contains a lot of recipes for puddings. A recipe for a suet pudding known as the Duke of Buckingham pudding contains rose water as a flavoring, which is very old pre-vanilla. 
popular flavoring, um, and it's boiled in a cloth, as old puddings often were. Um, similar recipes appear in cookbooks dating to the 1700s. I made this ice cream recipe, which is flavored with lemon, because again, this is before vanilla was really widely available. I believe that the recipe book may have belonged to Wilson's great-grandmother, Ruth Jeffers. Um, another possible candidate for the recipe book is Westcott's mother, Mercy Harris Westcott, who um, is pictured here. There are many aspects of Maryland now that aren't necessarily represented in my cookbook collection and database. People tend to share recipes online. Communities don't put out as many cookbooks. Plus, of course, there's so much traditional cooking that doesn't even use recipes to this day. A truly comprehensive Maryland holiday recipe cookbook would include dishes eating for, um, eaten for iftar during Ramadan, Ethiopian dishes, Salvadoran chicken tamales. Um, it'd be pretty much impossible to create a book that would encompass all of these traditions. Looking through my database for holiday recipes, I also noticed a lot of seemingly singular traditions that fascinated me. One person's coconut Christmas cookies, um, oyster fritters for Easter, or that Welsh cake that was made in 1981, possibly by one person celebrating and learning about their Welsh heritage. Although they didn't all make it into my book, I thought about the lost holiday recipes that never really became traditions. Maybe they were two of their time. This is an image of a salad that I made called Kris Kringle salad. You cook apples in um, melted cinnamon discs to flavor them and then serve it sliced with avocado and French dressing. Other similar recipes use pears as Christmas bells with dyed cream cheese piped for bows. Um, I don't know about you, but I haven't met anyone who um, has this as a holiday tradition in this day and age. But everything was new at one time. Many recipes we take for granted today started as trendy ideas in newspapers or magazines or cooking shows. Um, my family makes these fosnocks, known in Western Maryland as kinklings, um, but this only became a tradition for us in the 1960s because of this newspaper article by food writer Clementine Paddleford. My grandmother clipped this recipe and she would make these for dinner once a year. Um, my family also makes a Christmas cake that my great grandmother would make for holidays and gatherings. And the crucial ingredient is a, an artificial flavoring that was developed in a lab in the 1930s. A few months ago, I set up a booth at the farmer's market and I asked people about their holiday traditions. I heard some great stories. People talked to me about sauerbraten, making apple pie with their mother. The variety was great, vegetarian chili, Swedish meatballs. Um, a few people came up to me and they'd tell me about a tradition that was newer, a recipe they found for, you know, some chicken with pistachios, and now they make it again and again for holiday gatherings. Um, I sometimes got a sense that maybe they thought that these recipes were less important. But imagine now going back to be the first person to use oysters instead of fish in a stew for Christmas in your very first years in a new land. Imagine how meaningful it was for the ladies of the Bethel to introduce friends and family to kimchi and rice cake soup and New Year's celebrations as their roots in Maryland grew deeper. Um, I once read a quote from author and historian Michael Twitty um, that really stuck with me. He said, the food doesn't give us meaning. We give meaning to our food. I believe that we can honor our ancestors with recipes and traditions they left us, just as we can honor our chosen families with what we bring to the table. Or we can bring out these recipes just because we like the familiar taste and we want an excuse to eat donuts for dinner. Uh, Festive Maryland Recipes is a deeper exploration of some of these and other stories. Um, recipe developer Rachel Rappaport took some of the recipes from these old cookbooks and she tested them over and over to write out um, instructions that anyone can follow. There's no cook it till it's done recipes in this book. It's recipes that um, that normal people can understand. You don't have to cook it over a hearth. Um, my friend designer Sarah Tomko and illustrator Ben Klassen, they made the book look absolutely beautiful as you can see. And one of my heroes and also a flame keeper of Maryland historic cuisine, John Shields generously uh, took the time to write a foreword for the book. 
I hope that Festive Maryland Recipes deepens your appreciation of some of our state's traditions and encourages you to cherish your own. Well, thank you very much for that quick overview of Maryland holiday traditions and, and cooking. Where, if I wanna get a copy of this book to give to myself or to friends for Christmas, where can we purchase a copy of the book? Um, I have them on my website, oldlineplate.com. Um, also, if there's any local bookstore that um, you think would be a good place for it, have them get in touch with me because I am selling them wholesale to bookstores. Okay, so oldlineplate.com is where you should go if you want to purchase a copy of, of this festive Maryland recipes. <clears throat> um, I really have enjoyed this uh, learning about this. First of all, as I said, Southern Maryland uh, stuffed ham is a, a tradition I was introduced to uh, when I worked for a while in, in Charles County. Um, so when I saw it in the cooker, I was like, yes, I know that. Yeah, um, I love discussing that one. Um, I know there, you know, there's a long segment of this uh, talk that's about it just because it's so interesting and it really is something that hasn't caught on with the wider, you know, with the wider population. And I think that's really special um, that it's so unique to that region and also so, so time consuming. But. Very time consuming by all the reports. Um, when I have looked through and I, I told you, and I'll share with our our listeners um, that I have uh, my, one of my father's cousins was, was a cookbook collector um, and also contributed to a number of different community cookbooks. And by happenstance, I inherited Mildred's uh, cookbook collection. So I went back and pulled some of the Hartford County and Maryland uh, community cookbooks that, that she was a part of. Um, I have one from the Country Garden Club of Hartford County uh, from 1970. Uh, the country garden. Um, one of the things I noticed in this book as I went through it, not so much the recipes, but every woman in this book is who's married is identified by her husband's name. So Mrs. Reginald Treban, um, Mrs. Robert Archer Jr., Mrs. Carol Hopkins, Mrs. Charles Irwin, Mrs. Frederick Hodes, um, Mrs. George Sprague. Um, so the 1970s, 1970, the women who contributed to this book who were married were all identified by their husband's names. By the 1980s books that I was, by, by the mid 70s, because she has a lot from the 70s, you see a mix of women who are identified by their husband's last names and just by their own names. Barbara Webster or Helen Fontu or Trudy Karski. Um, in, in the case of, of Harford County, you can also see a mix of the folks who grew up here, uh, Barbara Webster, for instance, uh, versus folks who may have moved here from the city, um, where you see a lot more of the uh, uh, Polish and Italian names. Um, so, but this other lady is Mrs. John Everhart. So you see a mix of women identifying themselves either by their husband's name or by their first name. And by the time I got to the 1980s cookbooks, all the women were identified by their own first names. Um, and I don't know if you've seen in the books that you look through that kind of a pattern in the way women identified themselves or not. Yeah, absolutely. You start to see more and more um, first names, but that's also just such an interesting example of how much you can find from cookbooks that you wouldn't expect. Um, like you said, you can see um, people with immigrant heritage spreading out through Harford County. Um, and also you can see in a lot of these books, those recurring last names and you start to really, even just from flipping through a cookbook, you can really tell what families are really established with that church or that community. Um, there's a lot of last names that wouldn't have been familiar to me before that I just know um if i met someone you know with the last name dies or blizzard i'd know they're from the eastern shore um from all these books that i've looked at um but yeah older books uh the real old ones often will just give initials and they'll say like mrs g t um which drives me crazy because i'll never know who they were and um i like to go look up the genealogy of these people and find out where their family was from when they moved to maryland their whole heritage and their whole life story. So that um, makes me a little crazy. So I'm happy to see more complete 
names um, because sometimes even just using the husband's name makes it hard to figure out exactly who you're um, you know who you're looking at especially since often there would be you know the second or the third but they wouldn't necessarily use that in the last names um, you know if it's Mr. Richard Thomas the third it might just uh, at a certain point say Richard Thomas so um, well, and you, yeah, well, you would also have the situation because uh, many times women would die and their husbands would be married. You'd have two different women with the same, who would be identified as the same person, Mrs. John Smith. Yeah, exactly. So if you don't know the exact year that that cookbook came out, it's like, could be, could be either or. And um, often those people have completely different stories. You know, if there's like the recipe has a German influence and they had German heritage um, versus English heritage. So it, it makes it a little bit hard to pin down sometimes where the where the recipes themselves originated because recipes generally were passed down by women, um, you know, and the last names would change. Yes, um, although it's not a Maryland tradition, in my own family, um, my great-grandmother, um, lived in Kentucky and was a bourbon distiller. So she has a recipe for a Kentucky bourbon cake that is now in about its fourth generation. And I'm passing it on to my own children so that they will know how to properly make a pecan See, it's cake. A, it's a Maryland Christmas. recipe now though, because you're, <laughs> you know, you're here and you um, yeah. brought it here. So that's what happens. I've had to think about that a lot because sometimes you know, people would cut and paste those kind of recipes into a Maryland scrapbook from a newspaper and they'll say, uh, you know, Kentucky bourbon cake. Well, it's in the Maryland scrapbook. So it's going in my database, I guess, at that point, you know. Almost makes me want to experiment with that recipe and see what it would be like if I use Maryland rye whiskey instead of Kentucky bourbon. Yeah. Um, you'll have would a, that change the flavor of the cake? The invention of a new, a new dish, possibly. There you Which, go. you know, traditionally people had no choice but to do that because maybe they couldn't get, I think people could get bourbon, um, but, you know, people couldn't get certain ingredients. So they would make certain substitutions like that oyster, um, you know, the oyster stew coming from kind of a fish stew. It's not that they couldn't get fish, but there's, here's all these oysters, you know, they're so easy to come by here um, in Baltimore. They're working in the canning industry. So um, oyster stew became this Christmas standard. Right. And, and sauerkraut, I grew up with sauerkraut at Thanksgiving with the turkey. Um, that was just something that happened. And, and when I married this man from California and served sauerkraut on Thanksgiving, he thought I'd lost my mind. <laughs> I love the sauerkraut. Um, doing research for the book gave me so much respect for that tradition um, because I knew it's been around for a while, but I didn't realize just how far back that really dated um, but, you know, that's been that's been considered a Maryland standard since the uh, mid 1800s, you know, that sauerkraut's on the table um, doesn't matter if you're German or what. And so the, it really uniquely made that leap here where it became something that absolutely everybody does. And it makes sense. Um, Turkey's so rich. Thanksgiving foods are so, um, you know, so, so rich and like the flavor. It's nice to have that like tartness there. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we, you and I have talked about is Scrapple, which is a standard here in Harford County um, and apparently in Baltimore as well. Um, I grew up with it made by the local, but a, a local butcher here, which I can't get that particular kind of Scrapple anymore because they don't, they're not in operation. Um, and people, I think, associate that with Pennsylvania. But that really actually goes pretty far south in Maryland, at least through Baltimore. I don't think it's um, made it into Southern Maryland, on the other hand. Um, yeah, I'm not sure of that, but I know it's, you know, it's popular in the Eastern Shore and Delaware, too. Um, and yeah, there was at least one um, sausage company that made Scrapple in Baltimore. I think in Baltimore now you'll find it primarily eaten by older people, but we still have it in the diners. A lot of them don't don't know how to cook it but they have it because people want it um and scrapple is such a good example of um such a, a taste of home and to those of us who grew up with it you know we just love to to share it and talk about it and if you don't like it you know you're fine you're not in the club that's that's your choice I know some people uh you know some people are 
scared of Scrapple, but it's such a wonderful, um, you know, it's such a wonderful special, special thing for those of us who like it and can. Well, it's just, it's just, it's just right. part of the cuisine with which we are accustomed. Yeah. Um, but it's very specific. It's very specific to our part of the world. Um, so that that's been a, a great, that's a great example of a very localized food. Yeah, I highly recommend um, William Woy's Weaver's book about Scrapple. Um, I originally bought it to do research and ended up passing my copy through my whole family. My grandmother, read it and, you know, my uncle and, um, you know, it has a lot of good stories in there and a good images of the old companies that used to manufacture Scrapple and stories about people. Um, Elizabeth Ellicott Lee, that cookbook author that I mentioned, she actually has the oldest published Scrapple recipe in her cookbook. Um, so the oldest Scrapple recipe is in a Maryland cookbook. Um, and it's that 1859 book by Elizabeth Ellicott Lee. Yeah. And I can imagine, I mean, it, farm families would have made their own Scrapple. I mean, they butchered the hogs. Yeah, they, they killed them, they butchered them and prepared the meat so that they would be able to eat it through the year. Yeah, it's all a part of that, um, you know, that whole process of using everything. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so very, very much for joining us today. Um, this is a great way to think about um, as we enter into the holiday season. Um, we can, people are starting to think about what am I going to cook for Thanksgiving? What am I going to cook for Christmas? And I think festive Maryland recipes might be a really good source for something that's uh, very specifically from our area, I mean, but maybe unique, something your family hasn't, uh, a given person's family hasn't seen before. I want to encourage our listeners, please, to click the follow button on your YouTube, on YouTube, so that you can be alerted to additional episodes of our speaker series. And I also want to invite you to two of the Historical Society's uh, upcoming uh, holiday events. The first is our greens sales that begins in November. Uh, for Advent wreaths, you can place your orders by November the 25th, and you can pick the wreaths up on November the 29th. Uh, centerpieces and Christmas trees, you place your order by December the 4th, and you can begin picking them up on December the 6th. More information is, of course, available at our website, www.harfordhistory.org. In addition, um, this year, we're going to start um, a tour of Bel Air where we talk about um, Harford County Christmas traditions um, that will offer two tours. They will be or tours two weekends beginning on Friday, November the 24th, every Friday and Saturday until de December the 16th. Um, it's a one and a half hour tour of downtown Bel Air uh, with a docent who will tell you about Harford County Christmas traditions. Tour groups are limited to 20 people. Um, you can get more information again on our website, www.harfordhistory.com. Thank you very much again for uh, being part of our speaker series. This has been fascinating and fun. Um, and I hope to see our listeners um, again uh, after the new year with a new episode of the speaker series. Thank you Thank very you so much. much.